In this presentation, Route 5 will be showcasing our take on the Geo2 project. This video is broken down into the three main components of the Geo project, and they are the problem definition and FEM, modeling of the problem, and the results and discussion. We start off with an introduction of the team members. First is me, Alexis Ha, who will be in charge of the explaining of the problem, what FEM stands for, and the constitutive model. Next, we have Michael Gray, who is responsible for the modeling procedure, selection and reasoning of boundary sizes and conditions, and element discretization. And finally, we have Nicholas Brutogalis, who will further discuss the results. We were given two choices for the foundation, and our team picked option one because it seemed easier. Option one rests on homogeneous and uniform soft clay, and we will analyze the foundation performance as the cement amount is increased. A comparison of the results will be explored in this video. We were given a variety of data that would help us evaluate the performance of the foundation, which includes the formula shown in the middle, and we were also told to assume the soil behaves linear elastically. FEM stands for finite element method, and this method computes approximate solutions for complex problems. Finite meaning small, and the divided parts are called elements. The geometry is divided into small elements, boundary conditions are added before calculations are done and reassembled in the end. FEM, because of its powerful numerical technique, can be used in a variety of engineering, such as mechanical engineering, trust analysis, and structural deflection in civil engineering. The constitutive model essentially describes the response of material to the loads being applied to it. We have four different types of models, but as stated in the assignment, we are told to assume to use the linear elastic plastic model shown below. Recalling this equation from before, we substituted the cement amount into the equation in order to get the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio as shown. Hence, we are able to plot the stress strain curve for the soil. The strain increases at a rate of Q equals 3G until failure point, and from the graph, we can find the shear modulus to be approximately 6,700 kilopascals. Likewise, we found the volumetric strain to be zero because we were told to assume its undrained conditions. From the provided data and formulas shown, we are able to plot the stress strain curves for the concrete foundation as well. Likewise, we used equation 4.4 to find a volumetric strain and hence plot the curve as shown to the left. I will now talk about how the group implemented boundary conditions and discretization to develop an accurate strain seven model. The main objective was to ensure that the model accurately represented the behavior of the soil in real life. Firstly, the boundary size was determined to be 3.75B in width and 5.5B in depth. This was taken from the lecture contents of Civil 491. This size is chosen to ensure that the boundary is large enough to adequately model the soil behavior. Next, the appropriate boundary conditions were applied to the model. Along the bottom of the model, each node is restrained in the X and Y direction. Along the left and right side of the model, each node is restrained in the X direction. On the nodes that represent the footing, an initial displacement in the Y direction of negative 0.1B is applied. These boundary conditions model the soil symmetrically. In order to derive accurate results from any FEM method, the appropriate discretization of elements is essential. It is generally acceptable for elements to have an aspect ratio of less than four. A greater number of elements within a model will lead to more accurate results. However, it will also increase the processing time. The quad eight plate element was chosen as it is more accurate than the quad four element. The group performed a test by subdividing each element in half and obtaining the results. This process was continued until further subdivision yielded no more accuracy in the results. The results of this analysis were reviewed in the form of colored contours over the soil. This way, both the specific values of interest as well as the overall distribution could be examined to properly understand the soil's behavior. The main results of interest were the settlement and stress strain relationships. As expected, the soil had zero vertical deformation at the base of the model and no horizontal deformation around all edges. This was a good way to validate that the boundary conditions had been correctly applied to the model. 
<clears throat> the maximum vertical displacement was found directly below the foundation at a value of 0.1 B as applied, with the maximum horizontal displacement, displacement slightly off center under the footing due to the boundary conditions imposed. The stress and strain <clears throat> beneath the foundation seem to be the most concentrated at the corner of the foundation. This is due to the nature of the deformation as can be seen by the displacement vectors, creating concentrated stress at this point. The maximum stress value was calculated by the model to be 6.95 kilopascals, much less than the calculated bearing capacity of 285 kilopascals. One of the most significant results extracted from the strand seven model of the footing was the ultimate bearing capacity. This value was obtained by plotting a graph of the vertical reaction force at each node for all of the 17 load increments, as shown here in the graph. The sum of these was then found for each increment and could be plotted on a graph against the load increment to find the bearing capacity. When converting the force to a pressure, the area was found from an assumed one meter width of the footing and a corrected length to account for the error in the FEM modeling, calculated as 0.9 meters. The force value could then be divided by this area to calculate the allowable bearing capacity of the soil, given as 285 kilopascals, as shown in the graph. To validate the model, a comparison of the ultimate bearing capacity calculated by the model to the calculated through conventional methods was done. Using the theory from the Skempton's chart shown, the NC value was calculated as 5.14 CU by the formula given. Through the FEM model, an NC value of 5.07 CU is achieved, with the difference of 0.07 small enough to validate the results of the model and assume the other results to be correct. This validation process is very important as errors in FEM solutions can be found through incorrect meshing, incorrect boundary conditions, or just an overall lack of understanding by the designer on how to apply the constitutive model theory. One potential cause of error that was noted was the shape of deformation of the element just to the right of the foundation. As is evident in the animation, this element begins to deform excessively at higher load increments, most likely due to the shape and aspect ratio of the particular element. This shows a good example of the importance of correct meshing in creating FEM models that accurately represent the soil's behavior. However, as the results were validated through the conventional methods, the effect of this error can assume to be negligible on the accuracy of the results achieved. The shown graph of bearing capacity versus deformation clearly shows that the addition of cementation to the soil leads to an increase in bearing capacity. As expected, higher percentages of cementation lead to higher bearing capacity. The shape of the graph follows the linear elastic perfect plastic constitutive model. It is noted that the gradient is similar in each case within the linear elastic region of deformation. The implications of this effect and its applications to the real world can be very useful. If a structure is required to bear under a small base footing, it is possible that the ultimate bearing capacity of the soil will be exceeded. In some instances, it is not possible or practical to increase the size of the footing. For example, in a high density urban living area where land is expensive and held at a high premium, cementitious material could be added to the soil to increase its bearing capacity to the point where failure will not occur. In the modern construction environment, this method may be preferable to other approaches to increasing bearing capacity, such as installation of a deep pile foundation. Adding cementitious material to the soil may provide adequate bearing capacity faster and at a lower cost than the installation of deep pile foundations. Hence, the results of this analysis are presented as a promising and useful methodology for the improvement of ground soil. Overall, the strand 7 model used 17 load increments and found ultimate bearing capacity to be 285 kilopascals, with the largest vertical displacement was roughly 0.16 millimetres and maximum horizontal displacement was 0.041 millimetres and the soil failed in a circular arc manner, which was expected. The results were validated and found that unrefined mesh gave slightly higher values than the refined mesh and it's found the amount Increasing the amount of cementation will cause the bearing capacity to increase as deformation continues. And thank you for watching our video.